Thank you, Mayank. Uh, when it comes to STEAM, if any one person can combine the perceptions and overview of a manager, the technical know-how of an engineer, and the skills of a mechanic, it has to be Alexander Kahn's, our next speaker. He is no armchair STEAM buff like most of us are. He is a totally hands-on person. I first met him when he was the keynote speaker at the annual Congress of the Indian Steam Railway Society in November 2015. In spite of being only 22 years old then, his knowledge, passion, and love of steam and steam locos was fully on view and totally infectious. I met him once more after that, and it is indeed a pleasure, the kind of enthusiasm he has, the kind of knowledge he has, the kind of passion he has for getting onto a steam locomotive. I mean, he would not like to travel in a coach behind a steam locomotive. He'll be on the footplate. He will be, in fact, under the locomotive if he gets a chance. Anyway, uh, Alexander's talk today, will, uh, he will try and cover the overall health of the steam movement around the world to preserve and run steam locomotives and how enthusiasts can actively involve themselves with the process of maintaining and working with them. He will cite examples of not only the problems and challenges faced by steam buffs, but also demonstrate the triumphs in the face of a myriad of problems. So over, over to you, Alexander. The stage is all yours. JL, thank you. Can you hear me, first of all? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. I'm very, very glad to see all of you. And before I start, I'd just like to pass my regards to you and Vikas Arya, Ashwani Lohani, uh, Ramesh Kumar, Rajiv Padie, uh, Ravinder Sarawat, Arvind Mina, so many others uh, who I was so happy to be around last time, and I hope they're all well and in good health. So to start off, let me just see if I can get this working. Um, all right. Let me... Portion of screen. All right. Can you see, can you yes, see this you can. photograph? Yeah, we can see it. Okay, let me uh, let me just adjust the frame a little. Perfect. All right, so you, do you see two two next to each other? Yeah. Okay. Well, then I'll start. And let me. All right, you can still see it. Yeah, we can see two pictures. Okay, and and, and you can't the uh, your window was not in the way of it, right? I'm just kind of. I wasn't a kid that grew up on a screen. No, no. <laughs> Neck okay. on it. You can still see it? Yeah, we can Very see the picture. Two pictures, right. in fact. So I'll start by saying the... Uh, one sec. There we go. The reason and the focus of this conference is obviously our shared passion for railways. And I would like to think that keeping that passion and its results, the results of the passion, like the running steam engines and the preserved history... Um, I would like to think that our goal is to keep that as pure as possible. Uh, for those of you that were here a while ago uh, when Ashwani had the floor and uh, I briefly exchanged questions with David about the uh, new single in England, um, that's the kind of thing we're talking about. So, you know, this whole, like for, that's just one issue, uh, new build locomotive replicas versus the original real thing. That's a very important issue to me. Um, so among other things, the reason why I'm here in this conference and why I've been to India before and why I'm privileged to call all you gentlemen friends and colleagues is because in what other country can you see a, an 1855 single wheel locomotive that is not a replica blasting down the main line, you know, at full speed with no back engine. So uh, I've come to talk about today keeping what we love close to its roots, where it usually starts, and how we can keep it that way in the face of uh, a more sterile, modern, uh, at times very unpleasant world, um, and, and how, how we cannot collectively lose our way uh, as a community and a group of projects and a group of people. Uh, people are largely the topic of this discussion. Um, you know, so people seem to talk about the, the, one, the one big challenge to running preserved steam engines in this day and age is not a technical problem. It is not an enthusiasm problem. There, there are 
there are there is talent out there in the world. There is drive and passion and work ethic. That is not the problem. The problem is the regulatory stance, uh, the the fear, the things such as the insurance and what have you. It's it's a much bigger problem in the West right now than it is in places like India and Eastern Europe. Um, but the things that we seem to forget is that these are not forces of nature. These are things, entities, uh, situations created by us, by people. And if we keep our mindsets close to something like Mr. Ashwani Lohani's mindset, these things do not become problems that can stop what we want to do. Um, since there have been railways, there have been people who have loved them. Since there have been steam engines, there have been people inspired and deeply affected by their sublime beauty and dynamism. You can see that in these black and white photographs. These, these are young railway enthusiasts in the days long before any steam engines were beginning to be phased out. Uh, there were no diesels or electrics. Well, there were electrics, but steam engines were still out in force. Nobody would, was thinking about them going away, but there were still people taken with them. We have... We have uh, examples of people falling in love with these machines back in their heyday before any replacements were conceived. There were famous composers inspired by them, such as Antonin Dvorak. So this is nothing new. We are not, we're not doing something new. If, if anything, uh, it's only increased in desperation when these machines began to be destroyed, um, as Ashwani talked about. And he said it best in a conference in 2015 that I was present for. He described it as perhaps the most beautiful object created by man, period. And uh, I completely agree with that statement. And I think that, that people from every walk of life who have ever dealt with a steam engine probably would agree. Um, I came to India in 2015 as a guest of Ashwani Lohani and Vikas Arya. Uh, to be the keynote speaker for the ISRS National STEAM Conference, International STEAM Conference, I should say, and, and more importantly, to help the active steam locomotive program in any way I could during my short stay. And uh, there's a picture from 2015, uh, the first time I had ever seen a WP in person, and it was every bit as good, uh, if not better, as I had hoped. I, I had been around steam locomotives before, of course, and engines, but something about Indian steam is is not like anything else, and it's something you can't really put into words. Uh, I I was inspired to come to India in the first place by seeing this incredible documentary the National Geographic made called The Great Indian Railway, which I'm sure most of you, uh, if not all of you, have seen. And I decided I was going to get over there in, in any way possible when I heard um, Vikas and Ashwani and lots of other of their men had begun the revival of Rawari Shed. I came again in 2018 for a much longer time uh, as a guest of Tarun Takral, who we had before on the program, and the railway board. And this was not so much a visit to be a keynote speaker or someone up on a stage. I, I wanted to work and contribute work to the programs. Any active steam or steam that was not yet active that needed to be, um, I wish to help with. And um, during, during this stay, for a few weeks, I, I did everything from providing information to late night labor in the sheds and helping test locomotives on the main lines, thanks to uh, these wonderful people giving me access to do so. Um, so I also have to be brutally honest, we, we won't get anywhere. We won't get anywhere uh, by just talking about positives. We also have to bring up uh, negatives. And I came to India not only because of my enthusiasm for what I saw going on in that country, but also because of my frustrations with what has been going on in my country, the United States. And uh, what I've been seeing happen here, um, it has been so long since steam died as a going concern here. And we also have this problem of uh, railroads here being run in this very interesting corporate way. It's not like, it's not like really anywhere else in the West I can think of. Um, and you have entire networks of, of people, uh, being run by, by, uh, you have, you have entire networks of railways being run by, uh, people that have little to no practical experience anymore. And there's, a uh, real toxic work environment problem and, and the steam, the steam programs, um, 
you you have a you have a, a big people problem in the in the operational culture here now, especially in the mainline programs. Uh, there are very few machines that are certified to go out on the main lines, and you have something where it's like if the machine is uh, owned by a uh, private going concern, um, it won't be able to go out on Union Pacific trackage or something like that. Uh, and, and a lot of the, the uh, other problem is now that um, a lot of restoration jobs are done for money instead of for enthusiasm or, or things like that, which is, which has created a very big problem of um, very few running engines left compared to other places, uh, shoddy or varied worksmanship in a lot of those engines and um, a real sort of unpleasant working environment around the ones that are running a lot of the time, especially if they are high profile. So uh, preservation is as much about the people involved as it is about the machinery. And this is something I had to learn the hard way over many years. Um, the, uh, there's a certain, in, from, from what I've seen, especially my travels through the world, uh, to places like India and England and uh, Poland and Bosnia, pl places where you can still find uh, steam working with no fuss, even if it's preserved. Um, there's this golden type of personality that you really want to look for. It's always the catalyst for a good preservation movement. Ashwani Lohani is one of those people. Um, it's the sort of person who's sentimental enough that the directive to save and salvage and rescue and repair is innate to themselves. Whenever they see, you know, something rusting away in the siding or, overgrown with leaves, uh, there's this sort of mother bird instinct that kicks in and says, I need to save that. And, it, and it's, uh, it's just innate. Um, it's also someone shrewd and intelligent that has a natural mechanical inclination uh, and a resistance to nonsense or obstructionism. Because when you are a, an engineer, you tend to look at the world in a certain way and you tend to be very resistant to things that you know are not true. Um, and more, most importantly, it is someone who acts on a selfless love for what they are trying to save and have a pride in their work instead of the drive uh, for their own self and their ego and their status. You know, there are a lot of people who view something like in, in my country, a lot of people view something like getting up on a steam locomotive as a status symbol. And that is as far away from what that should be uh, as as possible. It is absolutely not about that. It has never been about that. It should never be about that. Um, and, and this, this sort of personality, this, this golden personality, and I've met hundreds of them and there are many more out there. This is the type of person, uh, which is why preservation of anything exists in the first place, whether it's steam locomotives or beautiful buildings or, uh, anything historic or anything beautiful. And it, this is the sort of person that I think the people who the fruits of these labors should belong to in the end. For railway preservation, problems have long since begun to arise in the developed countries where steam on railways is no longer in recent living memory. Okay, the early days uh, the, in the photo you see here, and, and this was great because we already had Michael Whitehouse talk about this. Um, in the early days, right after the steam died out, uh, wherever, whatever country you're in, in regular use, um, the, the, uh, the time period afterward is usually a balmy sort of time lacks in regulations, uh, friendly toward third parties, at least until there's some kind of problem uh, that, that occurs, uh, you know, because you have all the old guys running around who remember it. It's not a big deal. People just know what they're doing and know what they're looking at. There's no unfounded fear or anything like that. And you see in this photograph, people who love the machines climbing all over the machines and there's just no problem. And this is a wonderful sort of environment because you can learn, you can gain experience, you know, you, you can have all these wonderful little situations happen like, like some that I was in when I was 12 years old, running a standard gauge locomotive up and down a siding and just getting the feel of how it worked and how it felt. Um, this is not something that usually happens in America anymore. Um, so a steam locomotive, the fact of the matter is in these, in, in when you have this kind of mindset, a steam locomotive is still considered a locomotive. It's a machine that can move itself. It's capable of moving itself like any other form of locomotive and pulling a train, provided it is in good condition. 
And that is how they ought to be considered now, as long as they're fit to run themselves. There's nothing different about them now than there was a long time ago when they were first built, so long as they are fit to run in good condition. England is probably the best example I have seen of a place where preservation in the West has continued to triumph and stay pure since it became mainstream. This was helped because um, in England you had, well, and you still have steam buried in the culture of the nation. England invented the steam engine. Well, besides the uh, heroes of Alexandria, but um, that was a long, long time ago. England invented and perfected and put the steam engine to use. So it is innate in their culture more than anyone else's. Um, and the other thing that helped England was they had very high profile and articulate men such as Fred Dibner, the famous steeplejack, and Len Crane, um, serving as mouthpieces for their nation's love of its rich engineering history, which is something that a lot of other places lack, such as America and other Western European nations. There are so many of those in England who have steam in their households. There's model engineers and millwrights and ex-railway men, current railway men, youngsters and young apprentices, like you saw in Michael's presentation, uh, anoraks, and the men who brought, you know, the man who bought an Aveling steamroller at the local rally and fixed it with his son. During my trips to England, I worked with many of these surviving machines, and there are more of them in England per square mile than anywhere else. This giant engine you see on the screen is the Ellen Road mill engine. It's a 3,000 horsepower, four-cylinder double expansion engine that drove thousands of looms in a mill. This is my friend Anthony Pilling, who is uh, of Pilling Looms, the, the uh, textile looms. And he um, he's just a, a regular guy, but with a brilliant mind who loves steam. And there's there's millions of him in, in Britain. Um, this is a seven floor tall waterworks engine. It's a steam engine that pumped water to London, uh, one of many, and it's so big I couldn't fit it in one photograph. And this runs preserved. And here is a picture of just a rally I attended where we all went to the pub on a convoy of both miniature and full sized steam rollers, steam lorries, traction engines, road locomotives. Uh, and it's just a normal thing. And you don't see this in any other country, um, especially not with the regularity you see it in England. So there is a success story. Uh, England is a developed modern nation. Steam has not really served, uh, reciprocating steam has not served a practical purpose for a long time besides isolated incidents. And yet you can still see it over there being run correctly and maintained well. And um, it's in, it's, it's a very, it's, it's healthy. There's young people involved in it. Um, and the engines are, are still just the same as they were 100, 150 years ago. Um, the infrastructure exists for preservation. There are more talented young boilersmiths and machinists in England than I've seen anywhere else. Um, there's more of that golden personality type that I was talking about. And as such, the number of surviving historic machines is very large compared to everywhere else. And access to them for those who love them is high and healthy. And I was able to go and have fun over there with, with just about everywhere I went. And, uh, and, and as, as I said before, consequently, you are hard pressed to find a place in England without a well cared for and running steam engine of some sort in it, whether that's a local traction engine owner or a giant waterworks or a locomotive shed. Um, so, so that is an example I would say look toward. They have done a brilliant job and we have a lot of English gentlemen uh, and, and uh, women here in this um, conference from what I've seen. Uh, so in the United States and other countries, there are many misconceptions about the operation and maintenance of steam locomotives now, unfortunately, which not only makes their operation very costly when it doesn't have to be, but severely and increasingly limited in scope and surrounded by um, hostile work environment. Uh, the United States has a big problem with a mixture of people who quite often were never railway men with no concept of good and concise railway infrastructure or locomotive operation who are running the equipment. Um, and uh, the repeating situation of a small tourist railway or something where an engine worked by a small group of people uh, sort of starts at this little place in the middle of nowhere. It goes out a couple of miles at 10 miles an hour and then it comes back. Um, it goes nowhere. It does nothing. Um, things such as boiler inspections here have been made hideously complicated uh, or certifying a locomotive to work over a main line. Uh, these days is, is uh, anywhere between unreasonably strict to absolutely impossible, depending on what 
um, railroad you're dealing with. Um, so, and the other problem is when you do have a locomotive out on the main line in the U.S. and it goes somewhere on a big tour, um, it is so hyped up on the media, you, you get sort of a problem for the operators uh, because you have people chasing the things and compromising the infrastructure to get close to it. And, and when it does end up somewhere, um, it's virtually inaccessible to the people who love it the most. Uh, you know, those who, are, who would benefit from contact with the machines, um, they're so surrounded by rules and regulations and red tape and rituals uh, created and performed by people who genuinely, uh, generally fear the steam engines that they're working with, uh, which is a big problem I've noticed here and there is a large culture problem uh regarding regarding the people who demand sort of the celebrity status um in the involved with the locomotives so and the other problem is now i don't know if people around the world are aware of this but um you know we're not talking about the orient express but it, some of these tickets on these excursion trains uh here n not very noteworthy ones they cost hundreds and sometimes thousands of dollars um and, and you, you ride in a coach and you have no access to the locomotive at all, except for photography from a distance when the train is stopped. So it's, it's something that, in my opinion, isn't even worth participating in anymore. Now, in contrast, my last visit to India in 2018, uh, it was a rush of fire and water and whirling metal to be, uh, to, it, there's no other way to word it. Ashwani Lohani and Vikas Arya gave me access to this country's incredible railway system. And my friends who I mentioned before, such as locomotive inspector Ramesh Kumar, driver Ravinder Sararat, fireman Arvind Mina, just to name a few. There were so many. They, they allowed me and encouraged me to blend into the steam locomotives and the working of the railways in all the ways that I wish to and people, anyone like me wishes to. Uh, I worked late at night to assist with uh, with many different tasks. This this one here is fitting new rings to the piston valves on a YG in Rawari shed in the middle of the night. This is uh, at the new uh, the NRM in Delhi. Uh, the monorail locomotive would refuse to run in both directions. Uh, I have a lot of experience with valve gears is one of my specialities, and this engine has a uh, radial valve gear on it which uh, ended up having a rod of the wrong length, a vertical rod in the wrong, uh, wrong dimension so that the arcs uh, described by the valve gear were incorrect and the uh, engine could only one in, run in one direction unless you uh, changed the length of the horizontal rod connecting the radial portion of the gear to the valve. Uh, so I gave them temporary instructions to change that rod length whenever they wished to reverse direction until a vertical rod of the correct length could be sourced. Um, I got to work with that marvelous, marvelous machine, Fairy Queen, at Chakrabasti Shed. In fact, we had a bad axle bearing. And by the time I got there, um, they had told me what the problem was. We got the thing under steam. We, we had a new bearing uh, arrive made on specifications from a different shed that had a machine shop with a horizontal boring machine. Um, while it was still coming. Uh, I did a lot of remedial work to the locomotive with other people in the shed, including new piping being fitted um, to connect the water tanks. Uh, and, I, and once the bearing arrived, I helped put it in and pack it with the uh, cotton journal pads that, that are required on journal bearings uh, of this type which continuously rubbed the bearing with uh, oil, which is in a little reservoir underneath and it's picked up by capillary action like a wick. Um, and then afterwards, we steamed up the engine and uh, tested it at the shed. Um, I, I uh, did I did work to YG number three war three four one five um, Sahib, which had a terrible problem with a leaking uh, valve turret going to the steam blower. Um, and we tested that in the middle of the night. There's nothing more magic than steam at night. I cannot even describe what that's like. And and it never gets old. Every time I do it, it never gets old. Um, but I've, I've never been happier. I, I was able to, um, I was able to, uh, serve as fireman, uh, as a fireman, I should say on several test runs of, uh, WP 7200 Azad when we had it out on the main line for the palace on wheels test and main line runs to Rawari. 
and uh, we had a great time. And and it was just it it felt it felt good. And these guys treated me as uh, one of their own. I, I had run on railways all over the world before this, and I've done work at various places in the United States. But it, this was uh, you just you just get on the locomotive, and everyone knows what's what, and you just go. And it's it's fantastic. And this this is, I think, how it ought to be everywhere. Um, and in in fact, even after I left. India in 2018, um, I was I, I was doing video calls with uh, people like my friend uh, uh, Mr. Chattopadhyay at the NRM uh, uh, to um, to help him with the charging method and operation of the fireless locomotive they want to get going. And the uh, I was on the phone with the ADME at Shakur Basti Shed because locomotive Remgadi, which came in service last year. It had an, uh, the problem again of it would not run itself in both directions. So I was able to help them solve the valve gear problem uh, over a video call on the other side of the world, timing, timing a locomotive on the other side of the world, the wonders of modern technology. So during my visit, I was, I was also, I was very pleased and very humbled to see uh, how much access my fellow enthusiasts and I were granted, whether it be railwaymen who were retired or still working or people that it had nothing to do with railways. Um, it is beneficial for people who love these engines to gain experience in this way. If, if you have someone who is mechanically inclined and talented, but who has no background and he is able to get on and work with a steam locomotive, he will carry that with him forever and be able to assist other people with locomotives as he gains experience and this sort of thing snowballs into a large positive effort. Um, you know, I've spent, I've spent my life wandering the world and making strong bonds with people with similar interests and sensibilities uh, to me as, as I have and learning from them and the experience, knowledge and strength I have gained from these wonderful people and the machines that we all work with, like these steam locomotives, I've been able to take home and put to good use for myself. And just to show you some of these wonderful people, just a few of them, even though there's a lot of pictures, Vikas, Vikasaria and Ashwani Lohani, of course, uh, the inspector uh, who was assigned to a train I was on returning from Rawari, Ramesh Kumar in the foreground and a driver taking me back on a diesel at uh, early in the evening, same trip. Uh, Mr. Rajiv Upadhyay, who was in that special, uh, the National Geographic special, who I couldn't believe I met in 2015, who's become a friend of mine. Um, somewhere in these pictures is Mr. Jia Shankar, who is a brilliant man who, who, who designed a lot of solutions for the railways. These, all these people were very, very good to me. Here's Ravinder, Ravinder and Arvin. Uh, these guys... I traveled all over the network with them last visit and, and they were their railwaymen. I, they, they made me guests in their house. I I've, I've never been treated so well by anybody. Um, it is extremely important if these locomotives and the drive to protect them and keep them are to survive that the enthusiasts work to selflessly make the effort to keep them running and that the agencies or authority figures who control <coughs> them or the networks they can run on reach down and take the help that these enthusiasts offer and show trust and cooperation and due diligence. There must be trust on both sides, which uh, in the West anyway, in our current era is something that does not exist. Um, and this is something, it's sort of a difficult and controversial issue to talk about. These agencies must also be aware that the wrong personality types getting into things uh, could be very bad. You know, the sort of people who, um, who, who are in it for money or who are in it for status or, or uh, control instead of the love of the machines themselves. Um, the, the personality type I talked of before, the kind of person you want involved, they're very easy to recognize. Um, you can recognize them by a ceaseless hunger for knowledge and, for, uh, and, and a powerful and unending work ethic. They will work until they drop dead. <laughs> um, and a passion for the machinery and a selfless drive to contribute and work at no monetary gain. Every successful operation I've ever been a part of where you got a steam engine going or, 
or I led the operation to get the steam engine going, no matter what it was, was always volunteer. There was never any money involved unless it was money uh, from donations to buy materials and resources. These are the people you want working on and running things. And I cannot stress that enough. Um, be aware of those who are less willing to learn than they are to appear to be learn learned. Uh, be aware of those whose interest is in any way unhealthy. Be aware of those who seek to act as leaders, but do not have the personality or interpersonal skills or experience to do so. And be aware of those who try to work outside of the level of experience and who refuse to consult with others. Every success I have ever had has been whenever I don't know something or when I am uh, confronted with an issue that I cannot overcome myself, I will always consult someone who I know is talented or who has done it before. It's uh, the networking and talking to each other. That, that was my entire trip to India in 2018. Um, as an example of what I'm talking about, um, as well as my continued work at home, I'll, I'll just give you a few examples because the main thing I want to do, anyone listening to this right now who wants to involve themselves or wants to get a project going, uh, like we even, I saw some things in the chat about a gentleman uh, at Mysore who wants to get a locomotive going there. I want to inspire you all to do this yourself, to, to sort of um, leave the realm of dreaming about it and doing it. So here's some of, here's some of my work at home in the United States. Here is a waterworks engine. It was hidden away uh, in, in a modern active municipal water department in uh, Woburn, Massachusetts. The engine was built in 1908 and it last ran in 1933 and it was protected by uh, being hidden. It was hidden through the World War II scrap drives. This engine is full of brass and copper and other valuable things and it would have been destroyed by the scrap drives. And I was able to convince uh, by very sort of delicately handling the situation and socially uh, ingratiating myself a little bit to uh, convince the mayor of the city and the city engineer and the deputy superintendent of the public works to allow my friends and I to work on this engine. It took us two years to obtain the permission, but only four months to actually get the engine in steam. And you can see by the photographs, this machine is perfectly preserved. I, I am absolutely at a loss to explain how this machine got through World War II, retaining its gauge board instrumentation and clocks and lubricators and everything else. But it's just an example of what, what is lying around that you have to look for under rocks and in dark corners. Um, and this was when we got the engine steaming in 2018. That's Phil Christopher in the red shirt next to me. Uh, you, a lot of you here will remember Phil from the visit in 2015 when we came together. It wasn't just me. He's one of my very best friends and almost everything I've ever done with a steam engine, he and I have done together. Um, couldn't ask for better people. This is an engine that we dug out of a sand pit. Um, that's my friends and I there with it, but, uh, the engine, uh, the engine was dug out of a sand pit. It was hidden there to protect it from the scrap drives in the war again. And we got it dug out and we, we did a bunch of remedial work on it for about a month and uh, it steams again. And now it is a running machine. Uh, this is, this is a very interesting one. I'm currently engaged in an effort to preserve and restore the neglected antique rolling stock of the New York city subway system. So just like India is seeking to preserve its, uh, railway heritage by running steam on its main lines. Uh, the New York City subway is seeking to preserve its heritage by running cars, some of them as old as the 1880s, electric railway cars, some of the first ever in the country um, on its system and uh, within the system itself. And, and you can see them on special trains or sometimes late night moves. These are, uh, although they're not steam engines, they are arguably one of the most significant parts of my country's railroading history, as they have almost single-handedly moved my country's biggest city to continual success. The culture of the old way of doing things is being eroded within the system, unfortunately. You still have a lot of old guys there that know what they're doing, but um, there, are, there are a group of men there who genuinely cared about the system, men and women, uh, with an intimate knowledge of its components and its idiosyncrasies, and they still come in daily, despite being retired. A lot of these people still come in and volunteer labor as if they still work there, but they're retired. Um, 
And, uh, and one of the, the things that we love to do there is work on this antique stock. And uh, some of these self-propelled electric cars, the one in this photograph is from 1931. It's an R9 car. These are photographs of my friends and I working on these cars to get them back into condition. A lot of them are hidden there. Uh, some of them are secretly hidden away in sidings uh, where management doesn't know where they are. And it's, it's, like a, it's like a fairy tale book in a way. Um, although I do not work for the system, I am snuck into these shops by, by sympathetic superintendents and inspectors uh, who know me and who wish for these old, uh, old cars and train, train cars and items of rolling stock, which are still the pride of the system after all these years, to continue to exist and operate and have access to the system, despite an increasingly unfriendly management and uh, cultural shift against anything regarded as extracurricular. So this is something you'll see in these systems where... Um, they are uh, anything outside of the norm, old equipment, heritage, extra trains, special trains. They don't want anything to do with it. Um, these old and experienced people are a constant source of moral and technical support to me. And when we get together up in the shop, uh, they all tell me stories of the old system and all these adventures they had. And some of the things that they tell me really could only truly happen in a place like New York City. And they border on being unbelievable. Um, and they are stories which have something in common with every time old railwaymen talk to me, um, they are, the stories are rich in adventure and comradeship. And that, that is the thing, that is the kind of interaction between people that keeps this stuff going. And I have, uh, through all these pictures, you can see, these are my friends and I working in these shops. This, was, this one instance was a point where I had worked so hard, I basically fell asleep on the shop floor and they had to wake me up. Um, and the car above me is a car from 1949, which was so neglected and left outside. Uh, it was uh, it was basically ruined. And my friends and I have quite literally rebuilt the entire subway car from top to bottom. And just so you know, it's a self-propelled electric multiple unit car, a lot like what you have in India on the um, Mumbai or Bombay Metro, I think. Uh, each car is its own electric locomotive with its own control system. <laughs> Um, this is a technology that goes back uh, to the 1890s. Uh, and uh, one of these old guys I work with, his name is Stanley Reed. And he has, he has held almost every conceivable position in the operational role of the city's subway network and elevated network. And he has memorized every single signal placement and the speed limits and car types, uh, every operational idiosyncrasy of the entire network. And it's the opinion of me and many others that he ought to be running the system today. It's a shame that he isn't. And here, here is a uh, picture I did for his birthday um, of a healthier elevated system in New York. Uh, Stanley loves the elevated trains. And um, this, is a, this is a sort of a vision of what they could have been if we had not gotten rid of them. So all of this, my work here in my country, all, all the things, that's just a very small portion of what I've been up to here and what people like me have been up to. It's the stuff you don't really hear about because it's under the radar. It's, it's not these big high profile things. Um, it's the stuff that goes on behind the scenes. Uh, and uh, this brings me to sort of my last request here. Uh, it's, it's a request, everyone, everyone listening. Um, to the enthusiasts, to the people who want to be doing this, uh, don't think small. Don't become self-defeating. Don't, don't convince yourself that things can't be done, whether a boiler needs to be overhauled or, or there's some uh, specific part with a fine tolerance that needs to be remade. There, this, all of these things are possible. That's the easy part. The people part is the hard part. The mechanical part is the easy part. Um, don't, don't get stale and, and do not lose your passion or imagination or your dreams because these are why Fairy Queen is running on the main line. It's why any steam engines were saved at all once they started scrapping them. It's why, it's why anything beyond the gray norm has happened. And to those in power, to those looking down from your upper echelons um, of decision-making, um, such as Ashwani and Vikas and all the rest, uh, although they don't really need to be told this. They've already learned this. Um, to those of you in power or decision-making positions, uh, you have a history. You are 
in your position because of the incredible people in the past who designed and built and ran these systems for a century and a half or sometimes more. Please respect your past and your history. Remember where you came from. Remember why we have developed industrial nations. Uh, respect the history of the railway system and its machines and the people that did it and still want to do these things and remember these things. And please retain the people and machinery with the attributes such as passion and imagination, because without these, not only are our efforts at preservation doomed, but the engineering and completeness of the railway systems as a whole all over the world, the modern railway systems are also doomed to a future of internal hostility and apathy and non-functionality and mediocrity, because this is something I've seen all over the world. When, when the railways become corporate and lose sight of what they used to be and how to run, uh, they very quickly become uh, basically non-functional. And uh, that's, that is the end of my presentation. <laughs> Thank you very much, Alex. I do not know what to say. I see, uh, you had, uh, we've had 13 talks before yours, but none has had the passion that your talk has. If I read some of the comments that have come in, uh, you will understand what I'm trying to say. Apoor Bahadur says, fantastic talk by Alexander, pure passion flows. Vikas Arya says, absolutely fantastic, as always Alex. Vikas Singh says, pure, pure passion, Sherlock Holmes or Restoration. I don't think I can add to that. Well, th all anyway, thank you very much, that. Alex. You have, yeah. um, even for those of us who already had a fair amount of passion, you have generated a, a little more. Excellent. Uh, there are one or two questions. Uh, yeah. There is one question from Mr. Raghunandan, who is an expert in restoration in his own right. But I think his comment is probably the... Uh, I think the, the best I can I can see. He says he would like to apprentice under you. <laughs> well, I'd like I I think we could apprentice under each other, to be honest, yeah. because no nobody knows everything and, and everyone has something valuable to bring to the table. But that that is that is wonderful. But the fact of the matter is if if we if I can come back to India or go anywhere else at any time when I have free time and we can get one more engine in steam. Uh, then, then it's a triumph. It's a success. That's all there is to it. One or more, as many as possible. Uh, one of the questions that Mr. Raghunandan is asking is, he says, when, he's, when you speak about purity of steam, uh, when does purity cease to exist? This is a question ah. that torments vintage vehicle movement also. There are no clear answers. So what is your yeah. opinion on this? My, my opinion on this is, um, when the purity stops is when the fire goes out. And I mean that literally when, when the engine can no longer, when, when you no longer have a, uh, a pressure vessel full of water with a fire boiling the water to drive an engine, uh, that's when it's died. Uh, you know, a replica, I, I have my, my complaints about replicas uh, or uh, uh, things like that. But the fact of the matter is a replica properly built is a reciprocating steam engine and a steam engine is a steam engine. And um, that, that, you know, as, as long as we have that technology running, it is, it is important. And it, it's only a bonus. It's even better if the machine is 150 plus years old and can still run because they all can. Um, nothing's changed about them, maybe except for their condition. But the purity stops when the fire goes out and it starts again when it's lit. And if you can... If you can get an engine out, even if it needs almost all of itself replaced and you can get that done and you can get it done well, get the tolerances right and make it so it runs reliably without failures, then then it's a it's a brilliant job. And, and even if even if it's still worth it, in my opinion, if the machine is on a short section of track in a museum grounds and the boilers at half the original pressure and it's just moving back and forth very slowly, it's still an alive steam engine. There is no replacement for that. Very well put, Alex. Uh, there's another question from Vikas Singh. He mm. says, from many transport experts, he has heard that the future of mass transport is underground and not overground. What is your view? 
I think that is something that depends entirely on where it is. I, I think uh, for uh, something like an old city, such as, such as New York or, or uh, any, any large city that's already been built, I think that's very true, more so than elevated. But um, in, uh, or if we're talking about networks such as the Indian railways, where you have vast distances being spanned between cities or between industries, uh, I, they're, putting it underground would be essentially pointless unless uh, the terrain, you know, unless you had something like flat land with a big mountain and flat land and you didn't want to grade a railway over the mountain or something, then, then you, just make, uh, you just make a tunnel through it. Uh, Andrew Gibbon says, in India and the UK, and possibly the USA, interest in railways is much less among young people. What happened when the older generation, driven largely by nostalgia, isn't here to support railway preservation? If we do not do our job and listen to the old gentlemen, such as yourself and such as a lot of people here, uh, in, in both their advice mechanically and their advice on how to think and how to go about this, it will die. Um, in, in the UK, I would actually counter that remark. Uh, I have seen more young people with talent and drive and their head in the right place uh, in, interested in this stuff than I've seen anywhere else. I, I think if it's going to survive anywhere, it's going to be the UK because there are thousands and thousands of young guys um, who love this stuff and who have access to this stuff. Um, you know, when I, when I went to the Clay Mills Waterworks, there was a, there was a guy there running the steam engines who was 15. And he was a regular volunteer there. And he's going to go to mechanical, uh, mechanical program in an, in an institution. It's, you know, it, I was very encouraged by that over there. And you saw in Michael Whitehouse's photos, um, all of the, uh, a lot of the, the engine crew were young guys in their twenties, like me, um, who, who were being apprenticed by, by the old, old fellows there. And, and that's, that's important, but it will die. If, if you, uh, if we do not do our part, you know, every, if you love this stuff, you can't just sit by and say you love it or, or take pictures of it as it goes by. You have to involve yourself. Um, you have to go and, and uh, solicit the attention of these gentlemen and, and help with things and, um, and, and learn, learn how these machines really work and how to build them and how to fix them and, and what not to do and what to look out for. You know, I, I was taught um, by some very old frugal Yankees and some, and some really talented Brits uh, how to inspect a boiler with a hammer, um, which is what we used to do before we got ultrasound machines. And I was taught how to, you know, how to pr uh, preemptively troubleshoot things. When we were out on the main line with the WP, every time we stopped, I, I jumped off and I put my hand on all of the bearings to see what was, uh, what was getting hot and what wasn't. Um, and that, that sort of thing. Uh, and, and then the other thing is if you get involved, don't make a nuisance of yourself. These, these guys are very busy and they're, uh, there's a lot on their plate. That they have so try and uh try and be a help not a hindrance you know a lot questions are good but uh, there's a time for them and sometimes just sit there and watch what's happening and and you'll get the idea you'll get the idea in fact your last sentence is probably extremely important very often if, if you sort of uh, i'll use the word pester the person working yeah, the his reaction can be negative yeah hmm. yes there are many more comments. Uh, Jay, uh, I think David Viewing has his hand up. Yeah. So, David, please unmute yourself and. Uh, is okay, David can you hear me? Unmuted? I can hear you, yes. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Um, very quickly, thank you so much for those kind words about the UK. That you, you have no idea how much that's appreciated, actually. Um, but you're a little hard on your country, because I, I was in Cheyenne uh, to meet Ed Dickens a couple of years ago and subsequently in Ogden mm. uh, to see the big boy. And that's something I never thought I'd live to see. Never expected to see that in my entire lifetime. And what an astonishing achievement. So what do you think about the U.S.? Are there, are there going to be more spectaculars like that? What, what do you think? I think so. Uh, so one reason I am so hard on my own country is because... Uh, it's not really fair if you're hard on another one, but you can definitely be hard on your own. And I think that you can't get you can't get to here unless you aim much higher 
if that makes sense. And um, Ed's done a wonderful job on that engine. I know there was a few hangups, but there, there always is. And, uh, you know, we seem to have this momentary instance right now where there's a lot of very large locomotives coming back, uh, you know, on main lines. And there's been, un unfortunately, I have, be because I move within these circles, you sort of see the nasty underside of these projects and, and the interpersonal dramas between people. And it's very discouraging. And, and I'm, I know that that's everywhere, not just here. But um, mm -hmm. what I what I would what I would like to see happen in the United States is more small stuff, grassroots stuff, uh, short line uh, where, where um, you're isolated from the main line and you don't need the, the computer boxes and data recorders and, and things like that up there. And, and, and the other thing is that um, you guys, we, we had a very large gap. We, our steam died very, very hard and very quickly in the, in the late forties and early fifties. And, and there was this sort of, 20 year gap where no one did anything and then it picked up again in preservation and and the a lot of the uh, guys in post-war steam were who came on in that period were sort of as i've been told by them and by older guys taught to destroy the locomotives as quickly as possible so we can get the new diesels in whereas you guys in the united kingdom um, steam, if correct me if I'm wrong, died out in the 50s to 60s. But then the preservation, as as uh, Mr. Whitehouse said, sort of immediately took its place. And you have BR drivers and LMS drivers and people from the big four coming in and saying, well, this is how you need to do it. And this is the proper way. And, and, and this is what we'll do. So you didn't really have that gap. Well, I, I, I think something that is unique about UK is that at the time that steam went, uh, we closed uh, all of the branch lines as well. Mm. And the effect of that was a, a huge vacuum uh, that was filled by preservation groups. That's why there are more than 100 steam railways in, in England now. It's, it's not because they've been built by enthusiasts. It's because the, the government closed them down. And uh, so that gave us a, a fantastic uh, treasure trove, really. Uh, uh, we could pick and choose which, which railways uh, to to reopen, and, and that's going on every day um, right through the present time. Um, I don't think other countries have quite had that fantastic opportunity. Um, you're, you're so right. it's right the steam never died, but but I think it's also right what you said that's in our blood. But then I think it's in your blood as well. Just look at your presentation today. Well, uh, I thank you for that. I thank you for that. Truly, I I've sort of been a a misfit here, but I, I have a small group of friends who we go around and doing this with. But they're just I just find that. Here, there isn't the kind of absolute passion for it and, and just what it is. You know, I, you, you guys have done a wonderful job, and I, I, I hope and think you will continue to do a wonderful job. And I can't wait to return to England. My, my last visit was 2019, and I was just blown away by everything. <laughs> Thank and you. You say that Drew got oh, blown and, away. It, I think it, it carries a lot of weight. Thank you. And there's and there's one other thing I want to say too to you, you know, about the English. The showman's road locomotive is positively the most beautiful form I have ever seen the steam engine in, ever. And I know I know you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I own a, an Aveling steamroller, so I'm at the other end of that particular spectrum. Excellent. Is it a piston valve or a slide valve? It's a piston valve. <laughs> Excellent. And there's a joy, not not what you've heard at all. It's a joy, really. Uh, but we look at those uh, those showman's engines with all those lights, and we say, "Oh, you know, how tasteless." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I know about the Scholler, the Scholler debates. Yeah, you do. <laughs> um, but yeah, keep up the good work, and I, I hope to keep in contact with you and, and everyone else in here after this. And I missed the other presentation of that fellow with the the two six zero down in B Bogota. The South American. Yeah. Look at that. I've been meaning to get in touch with him for years. Okay. Thank you very much, Alex, for agreeing to come and give us a talk. Because no, I, I, I was as I said, your passion, passion. your passion is infectious. If we can infect even, um, I mean, if I could infect even one person per year, one youngster per year, hmm, and so that he, get, he has at least half the passion that you have, I think my work is done. Thank anyway, you. Thank you very much for a very, you, uh, not just a passionate talk, but a very entertaining talk. And a thank lot of home truths. Home truths that my... we, are, we are all aware of, but we don't 
uh, say them out. Give my best to uh, Ramesh Kumar and, and everybody who I, who I can't get a hold of so easily, please. Okay, we'll do that. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Okay. Good night, gentlemen. Good night.